to talk about what it means to be an atmospheric scientist. What is it that I study? Obviously, weather is a key, and we're going to talk about weather a lot. Uh, it's not, weather's not just one thing. It is a lot of things uh, under one umbrella that makes up weather. We're going to talk about that. Some of those things are what we call weather systems. Uh, high pressure, low pressure, warm front, cold front, uh, tornadoes, all those different things that make up weather and weather systems. The water cycle, you may have heard it once before, we're going to run through the water cycle again. Uh, then we're going to talk about the different tools of the trade, the things we use to track the weather and the weather systems, the different uh, sensors and gizmos and gadgets that I use uh, to keep tabs on the weather. And then we're going to talk about severe weather safety. It is uh, tornado season, after all, here in Missouri. And um, as it turns out, we may have some severe weather that we have to watch out for tomorrow. So uh, we'll have a few severe weather safety uh, tidbits for you. And if you're well behaved, and of course with your mics muted, you're all be 100% well behaved. <laughs> uh, we'll talk. We'll show you some great pictures of uh, videos of tornadoes. The tornado videos at the end, so you have to stay awake. Don't fall asleep and miss them. All right. So here we go. What's it mean to be a meteorologist? A meteorologist is a person like me who went to school to study the weather. I already told you where I went, St. Louis University. I studied the weather because I want to know enough about weather so that I can look at what's going on with the weather now, and then based on what I know, look into the future and say, okay, based on this, this is what normally happens next. And that is a process that we call weather forecasting. Weather forecasting is taking your knowledge of what's going on in the atmosphere now and then using it to look into the future and make a prediction. It's not unlike, frankly, being a doctor. In fact, I like to refer to myself as a doctor for the atmosphere. All right, I do a lot of the same things a doctor will do. When you guys get sick, you're going to go into a classroom. Or a classroom. You're going to go into the doctor's office. Um, the doctor is going to ask you about your symptoms. He might ask you, is it a headache? Is it a stomach ache? You have a sore throat, are you coughing? You have a runny nose. What's going on? Does your arm hurt? I don't know. They want to know what your symptoms are. They want to know what's happening with you right now. They will probably take your temperature using a thermometer. They stick the thermometer in your mouth. I stick the thermometer out the window. It's the same instrument. They're going to listen to how you breathe using a stethoscope to listen to your chest and your lungs. I listen and watch how the atmosphere breathes by monitoring the wind. The wind in the atmosphere is not unlike you breathe. It's like the breathing of the atmosphere. Doctor might check your blood pressure by putting that inflatable cuff, that balloon around your arm that he pumps the, the, the little ball, but it gets tighter and tighter. And then uh, they listen to see what your blood pressure is. I follow the pressure of the atmosphere. Is the pressure going up? Is it going down? That can tell us if the air is rising or sinking and whether or not we have to worry about rain, snow, or thunderstorms. All of those same things are very similar to what a doctor will do. A doctor will make a, a diagnosis. They'll say, you have the flu. If you have the flu, you're going to feel like garbage for a week, and then you'll start feeling better. For my patient, which is the atmosphere, I'll say, this. looking at the symptoms of my patient, I think we're in a stormy spring pattern, and this kind of pattern will bring thunderstorms every couple of days. That's exactly what we're in right now. You're actually going to see thunderstorms again tomorrow. And in this case, some of those storms could be a little stronger uh, than the ones we've seen the past few days. So we're going to keep close tabs on that. So I forecast the weather. The question is, what is weather? Weather, as I said earlier, is not just one thing. It's many things. It's a variety of things, all making parts of the same puzzle. So when I go to classrooms and talk to you in person, I always ask you to raise your hand and say, hey, what do you think of weather? What do you think of? These are some of the things kids always say. Wind, hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning, snow, rain, clouds, flooding, hail, tornadoes, sleet, snow. All of this stuff makes up weather. None of it by itself is weather, but it is all falls under the umbrella of weather. So does this, the water cycle. The water cycle is a huge part of weather. And... The key to the water cycle, and really the key to all things weather, is this thing up in the air above us, the sun. Without the sun shining down on the earth, nothing that we call weather would ever happen. In the water cycle, here's what that means. When the sun shines down on the earth, it's energy. Some of it hits the ground, but the part we're concerned about is what hits the water, the liquid water, the visible water that you can 
sea. You can touch, you can swim in it, you can drink. That's water. When the sun's energy hits that, it causes a process to take place called evaporation. Evaporation is the process that changes liquid water into invisible water. So it's visible water into invisible water. There is invisible water in every one of your rooms right now. Uh, it's in Camille's room, it's in Trayton's room, it's in Gabby's room, it's in uh, everybody's room. There is water vapor all around you right now. You can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't even feel it. You can sense that it's there, but it's not something that you can visibly uh, latch onto. Uh, the only way you're going to feel water vapor, the invisible water vapor in the air around you, is if there's a lot of it there on a hot summer day. When you go outside and all of a sudden you, you start sweating instantly, you, you, we call it air you can wear. It's the, the water vapor in the air is so thick it just sticks to you. And that's what we call humidity. Humidity in the air is the invisible form of water or water vapor. That water vapor gets caught up, the invisible water vapor gets caught up in the winds and pushed higher and higher in the atmosphere. Eventually, as it gets higher in the atmosphere, it gets cold, really cold. And that causes the water vapor to out of it. And by that I mean it causes it to go through a process, a new process called condensation. Condensation is the snap change from invisible water back to visible water droplets. Those water droplets start coming together, coming together, hanging out together in what we call clouds. They start building up in what we call clouds. Clouds are visible water droplets formed by condensation. Right? It's a collection of visible water droplets formed by condensation. Now, clouds can be a lot like sponges. They float around in the air, don't do anything. It's just water vapor or it's just water droplets floating around in the air. A cloud's not going to do anything until it fills up. And just like a sponge can just sit there and be a sponge, with, you know, there may be water in that sponge, but until you fill it up, it's not going to drip. If you take a big sponge to a little spill of water and wipe it up. You can wipe that whole spill up and not even have to wring the sponge out. But if you take a little sponge to a big spill, that sponge is going to fill up with water and you're going to have to wring it up. You can't hold it. All right. There's too much water in there. So when a water or when a cloud fills up with water and it can't hold it anymore, it starts to drip. It's like a dripping sponge. It's been overfilled. And when a cloud starts to drip, that means rain's falling, or if it's cold enough, snow has fallen. If it's a thunderstorm cloud, it could be hail. That's called precipitation. Any form of water, liquid or frozen, that falls from the cloud and drops to the ground is called precipitation. And that precipitation hits the ground, rolls back into the rivers, which roll back into the lakes and streams and oceans, where evaporation occurs again because of the sun, and then the water vapor floats up, and we get condensation, precipitation, flow, and it all goes over and over and over again. And it has been going over and over and over again since the beginning of time. It is the water cycle, and it is a hugely important part of weather. We're going to talk about invisible water vapor and condensation again coming up here in just a second. That's an important part of the water cycle. All right. Another reason the sun is so doggone important is because it really generates what we need to create wind. And that happens because of this. When the sun shines on the earth, the closest part of the earth is actually the equator. The equator is the closest part of the earth to the sun. No surprise, it's also the part of the earth that gets the warmest, the fastest. It's like standing next to a bonfire. You stand next to a fire, it's going to get really warm. You want to cool off, what are you going to do? You're going to step away from the fire. All right? That's the North Pole. The North Pole is way far away from that big fireball. So it's not just not getting warm, it's getting cold. All right? So what you end up with on the Earth is a big reservoir of warm air. It's a big bubble of warm air around the, uh, the equator. And then at the North Pole, you have all this cold air building up. The atmosphere does not like this. This is a huge imba imbalance between warm and cold. Nature and the atmosphere in general is all about achieving a balance between extremes. So the atmosphere has come up with a way to try and balance the warm and the cold, and that way is called wind. Wind is occurs when cold air tries to surge into warm air 
to achieve a balance between the warm and the cold. Same thing happens when the warm air blows north into the cold. We're constantly trying to mix, we being the atmosphere, the atmosphere is trying, constantly trying to mix the warm and the cold to come into a balance, to balance the warm and the cold together. So that one place isn't too, too cold and one place isn't too, too warm. And the process of doing that is achieved by those weather systems that we introduced earlier. Weather systems, the key ones we're going to talk about today, cold fronts, warm fronts, and low pressure systems. I like to refer to them as atmospheric blending because they're doing all the mixing, like that blender in your kitchen that's mixing all the ingredients that you need to make the perfect cake, all right? You're going to mix those together in the atmosphere using warm fronts, cold fronts, and low pressure systems. Here's how that works. So, let's we'll start with a cold front. When those cold winds get mixed down from the North Pole and they come surging south, that cold wind from the north usually has a pretty well-defined leading edge on it. You go from warm to cold and you know it, all right? It might go from 80 to 60 in just a few minutes. There's usually a nice big wind shift where the wind shifts to the north. We mark the leading edge, the front edge of colder air by a blue line on the weather map. The little blue triangle is pointing the direction that, that is moving. We call that thing a cold front. The cold front is literally the front edge of warm air blowing from north to south. Again, it's a blue line with blue triangles on a weather map. Same thing happens with warm air. When warm air surges north, those warm winds come northbound. Usually a pretty well-defined change in temperature with that warm front. North of the front, before those warm winds arrive, it might be cool and rainy and cloudy. But then here comes the warm wind from the south. We mark that by a red line on the weather charts with these little red knobbies. Those red knobbies point in the direction the front's moving. So this warm front is no surprise moving to the north. We call it again a warm front where the warm wind is blowing north. Now here's a different way of looking at it. We're going to look at it from the side view. So we're looking, this is the ground, all right? These are our houses on the ground. South is going to be the left. North is going to be on the right side of your screen. So when the warm wind blows in from the south, or left to right in this case, it's going to come up and it's going to meet up head on with the cold air coming from the north. So you have a warm wind and a cold wind colliding in the middle. Well, when you get two things colliding, you have two options. You either go up or you go down. Well, in this case, they can't go down because the ground's in the way. So when the warm wind and the cold wind collide, they have no other option but to turn their forces and point upward. So those air, the air comes together in the middle and gets forced up. Warm air comes and meets the cold and gets forced up. This is where we jump back in the water cycle. Remember that invisible water vapor we were talking about that's in all of your rooms right now that you can't see, but it's there? This is how that stuff gets pushed higher and higher in the atmosphere to create clouds. When the warm wind and the cold wind collide, they take that invisible water vapor that's just evaporated out of the oceans, and they carry that higher up into the atmosphere. As that air gets higher, it cools, Cooling of the air causes condensation to occur, and presto, you get clouds. Now underneath those clouds, where the air is rising, you're leaving kind of, it's like digging a hole, you're leaving a void, all right? It's like letting the air out of a balloon almost. You're creating what's called low pressure down here at the ground, because all the air that used to be here is now rising up above. So we call that low pressure. Low pressure is something we can track. It's an area of rising air above it, and when you have low pressure, you get clouds, and clouds are the stuff that we produce precipitation with. So, when you add up all the pieces here, rising air, low pressure is rising air, rising air creates clouds, clouds produce precipitation, so it makes sense that we want to track these things on our weather map. So this is what a full-blown weather map would look like. You have a cold front on one end, where the cold air is coming south. You have a warm front on the other end where the warm air is going north. In the middle, where the two meet, is where the air is rising the most. You get that low pressure area, and we now know that low pressure in fronts create rising air and clouds, and clouds are where it's at. That's where the exciting stuff happens. So that's why we want to know where all those are located, so we have to track them. Before we start tracking those weather systems, let's talk about the three types of clouds that can form. 
first one is the most important because it's the scariest one. This is the one that produces most of the bad weather. And by bad, I mean tornadoes and thunderstorms, lightning, heavy rain. All of that comes from these types of clouds. They have a bottom that starts at about 1,500 feet, so less than a mile off the ground, but they can tower as high as you know five or six miles up in the atmosphere. They grow rapidly, building through the course of time, getting higher and higher. Their edges are very sharp, very well defined, as you see here in this cloud. If this cloud gets big enough, it will become a thunderstorm. Until then, it's called a cumulus cloud. If it gets high enough and big enough, it becomes a thunderstorm and starts producing rain. Its technical term is a cumulonimbus cloud. A nimbus cloud is a cloud that's producing rain. Nimbus means rain in Greek. All right, the next type of cloud happens when the cumulus or cumulonimbus cloud gets very high in the atmosphere, all right? And when it gets high in the atmosphere, very strong winds are going to catch it at the top, maybe 100 miles an hour. And it's literally going to smear the top of this cloud in the direction of the wind for hundreds of miles downrange. So you end up a day or more ahead of the storm having these very thin, wispy looking clouds up high in the atmosphere. Clouds that look like feathers floating in the sky. Those clouds, as you can see here, are called cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds do not produce precipitation. They're made up entirely of ice crystals. They're too thin. They're never going to produce precipitation. So there will never, never be a nimbo cirrus cloud. It's just a cirrus cloud. The last of the three big types of clouds, if you remember back to Saturday, who remembers how crummy the weather was Saturday? Rain all day and it was crummy if you looked outside you could, it was hazy it was kind of foggy you really couldn't see where the horizon ended and the clouds began all right it was just a murky gray rainy day well turns out that that is a special type of cloud as well and that's called a stratus cloud a stratus cloud my my college professor meteorology had a very technical term he said the best thing I can tell you about a stratus cloud is it's your yucky day cloud. There you go, your yucky day cloud. Stratus clouds produce steady rain, they produce steady snow if it's cold enough, and just like cumulus clouds get a special name when they're raining, so do stratus clouds. We add nimbus to the stratus cloud to make a nimbostratus cloud. So a nimbostratus cloud is a stratus cloud that is actually producing precipitation. Okay. So we've now got all sorts of weather things that we've, we're tracking. Uh, we know about warm fronts and cold fronts and low pressure. We know about clouds. How do we find them? How do we keep tabs on where they are? How do we track them so we can make a forecast with them? Good question. We use weather instruments or sensors. And these are six of the main ones, okay? We'll start in the upper left corner. This one, when the wind blows, it cap gets captured in these cups and it flings it around and causes it to spin faster and faster and faster and faster. The faster that thing spins around, the faster I know the wind is. That thing is called an anemometer. That's not easy to spell. Just don't overthink it. It's easy to overthink anemometer. I used to want to put two N's and two M's. No. There, it's one N, a mom, and an enter. All right? Anemometer. All right, no two N's next to each other, no two M's, just a mom in the middle. It's an Anna with a mom in the middle, all right, anemometer. And the anemometer spell, or, uh, measures wind speed, tells us how fast the wind is going. The next instrument's called a barometer. The barometer tells me where the air is rising and where the air is sinking. That means it helps me keep tabs on where the winds, the warm, the cold wind are colliding and where that air is rising and where that rising air might create clouds. So a barometer is important for me to keep tabs on where the air is rising, and we use that to measure air pressure. Now remember, in the atmosphere, that invisible water vapor, we want to be able to measure how much of that there is in the air. The technical name for invisible water vapor is humidity. How much humidity is in the air? We want to measure, we measure that with what's called a hygrometer reason it's important to know is because the more humidity is in the air, the more rain may fall. It helps us know when clouds may form. And humidity is an important ingredient when it comes to thunderstorms and making clouds and uh, thunderstorm clouds. Also known as 
When rain falls, when precipitation falls from the sky, we want to measure that as well. And we measure precipitation with this tube. The rain falls into the tube, it collects, falls down to the bottom. We measure how much water is at the bottom of the end of the storm, and that tells us how much rain has fallen. We do not use a rain gauge, which is what this is, to measure snow. We have a different instrument to measure snow. It is highly scientific. It might be the most scientific instrument we have. Just kidding. It's a ruler. We all have this in home. Chances are you have a ruler at home. You have it in your school desk. Your parents have it in their junk drawer. When it snows, grab it the next time. So next winter, grab the ruler. If you want to officially measure the snow, we're going to take that ruler into the backyard. Find five different places that are a little bit far apart that are not next to a tree, that are not under the house, or an overhang, or right by the house, mark your asphalt or concrete. We're going to find five, five places where the snow is undisturbed, or mostly undisturbed. We're going to measure each one of those five places. Then you're going to average those out. I don't know if you've learned averaging yet in math in school. If you haven't, ask your parents to help you. You're going to average those five snowfall measurements together and that becomes your official total and that's how you do your home brewed measuring of snow it's not 100 percent official but it's close enough for 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 homework all right and yes we use a ruler to measure snow next one's super easy we all know what that is it's a thermometer and we know it measures temperature day like today nobody cares if it's 65 or 70 you just care if the sun's shining and it's a nice day Easy speezy, I don't sweat temperatures too much. I just want to get you in the neighborhood on a day like today. However, in the winter, it matters. It matters a lot. One half degree can matter a lot. How? Well, you know what temperature water freezes at? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You know what temperature water thaws at? 32.1 degrees Fahrenheit. I need to know to it, within a tenth of a degree, what the temperature is going to be like because it, 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 it's a huge deal. If I'm forecasting a foot of snow, and it could be a great forecast until the temperature gets to 32 and a half degrees and it all changes to rain. All right? Temperature is a much more important feature in the winter when making a forecast than it is um, in, in summer. So uh, it is the bane of my existence sometimes in the winter. It causes me to lose what little hair I have. Because the difference of a half degree, it can be a great forecaster or you all hate um, depending on which side you're coming from. So thermometer is important. Last one is the other element of wind that we measure. We've already measured wind speed, but I have another thing about wind that I'm interested in, and that is the direction from which the wind is blowing. Whether it's a wind sock or a weather day, we point the direction. Now, when I report the wind, it's always the direction from which from which the wind is coming, all right? So if I say, forecast is for north wind at 10 miles an hour, that means the wind is blowing from the north to the south. If I say the wind is blowing, it's gonna be a south wind tonight, which tonight should be a south wind. It means the wind's blowing from the south to the north. Why do we do it that way? It makes sense, because it tells you a little bit more about the air that's coming in. We know the air's colder north, so if the wind is blowing from someplace that's colder, probably then it's going to get cold. If I tell you that the wind's blowing from the south, you know that the, that warm air is building up at the equator, so chances are our wind blowing from the south should be, not always, but should be warmer. Tomorrow, it should be warmer. Better be warm. It should be about 77 to 80 degrees tomorrow, not on wood. But who cares, 77, 80, we're, it's a few degrees in front, right? All right. All those instruments I just showed you, with the exception of the ruler and the rain gauge, can be uh, created in a small version of themselves and then jammed into a shoebox or something about the size of a shoebox. It's called a weather balloon, all right? And we can take all those instruments, put them in this box, attach it to a balloon, and launch it up into outer space. Why, not outer space, excuse me. Launch it up into the atmosphere. Why in the world would we want to launch a, a balloon full of weather gadgets and gizmos up into the clouds? Think about it. Where does our weather come from? The weather we feel down here on the ground is actually the end of the story. This is the end of the weather. What we feel is the end of the book. It's the last chapter. 
Everything that's important actually happens up in the clouds. Almost everything that's important. Where does the rain come from? It falls from the cloud. Where does the snow come from? It falls from the cloud. Where do tornadoes come from? They spin down from the clouds. Right down from the cloud. Almost everything we care about comes from above and comes down to the ground. So it makes sense that we want to know what's going on upstairs. And that's what weather balloons are for. We launch them twice a day. St. Louis time, it's roughly 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Two times a day at roughly 100 different locations around the country. And each one of these balloons is measuring temperature and humidity, the wind, direction, and speed, and the air pressure at various altitudes all the way up to 1,000 feet. Now, sometimes when we have a big storm that we're interested in, we're going to launch more weather balloons. Okay? And that was the case a couple of years ago when there was a hurricane approaching Florida. We needed more data. We needed more information to figure out how strong that hurricane was going to be and which direction it was going to move. So we launched double the number of weather balloons. I happened to go to one of those balloon launches from the National Weather Service and I did a story on it. That's what you're going to watch here. You're going to get to see the story. It's about a minute and 20 seconds. It goes into what a weather balloon is, but it also actually shows the weather balloon launch, at least the first uh, couple of seconds of that launch when the balloon takes off. Here you go and have a listen. Time there. All right. Um, so that's the balloon. You can see the balloon in the middle. You can see, if you look carefully, the little white thing that is now the box. Um, it takes about an hour to reach, maybe a little over an hour to reach 100,000 feet. The balloon, when it gets way up there at the top of the atmosphere, will burst and it will fall back to the ground. Gravity always wins. That's the thing about gravity. If it goes up, it will always come down unless you shoot it out of the atmosphere. So this is coming down. Which is why we have this orange thing on there. I didn't talk about it in the story, but the orange thing is a parachute that allows the weather balloon and its contents to gently fall back to the earth. Now, a few people know this, but on the box of instruments, there's actually a return address. Once in a while, somebody will actually find one of these things and they ask that you send it back. Doesn't happen very often, but there uh, very often, but there is a return address on the box so that we can reuse these. I don't tell anybody actually have one. I didn't return it, but it's just a recommendation. So I have it for my like my my weatherman's trophy collection. So I have one of these. All right. Weather balloons measure what's going on inside the clouds, but we want to be able to see the clouds from a big broad vantage point. To do that, we have yeah. satellites. We launch satellites, we have multiple satellites up in space. They're machines that go up into space and then hover over the Earth in what's called orbit. Weather satellites orbit at 22,500 miles above the Earth. And all the while they're up there taking very high-tech pictures of the clouds, one every minute. And then what we can do with those pictures, this is one of those pictures on the left, we can take those pictures every minute and put them into a movie. And when we put that movie together, we can see how the clouds are forming and which directions they're moving. This is actually a movie of what became Hurricane Dorian. Hurricane Dorian, you might remember last summer was the tremendous hurricane that went in and just devastated the Bahama Islands. 
the northern Bahamas. This is that hurricane. Why are satellites important? Because they give us information in a part of the world where nobody lives. There's nobody living on the water out here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We would have no way of really knowing what this storm was doing if we didn't have the satellite to keep an eye on it. Satellite allows us to see how this storm is coming together, how it's strengthening and growing. And it, you see how it's showing us where the big black dot is here in the middle. That's called the eye of the hurricane. We can't see that very well from the ground, but we can sure see it in the air from space. And when it gets that crisp and that well, that cement, we know it's a very, very bad and dangerous hurricane. And that's the power of having a satellite. But satellites have their limitations too. They can't tell me which clouds are making rain or which clouds are making snow or which clouds are producing tornadoes. So I need something else. And that something else is called Doppler radar. Doppler radar is on the ground. And like an x-ray machine, will look into your body and look for something. Like if you went to the doctor and you, you'd fall and maybe you think you broke your arm, the doctor's probably going to take an x-ray to look inside your arm to see what's going on. Well, Doppler radar looks inside the clouds to show me where it's raining or where the winds are blowing from, show me where the hail is, all right? And here's how it works. The Doppler radar looks like this, and it's going to send out a pulse of energy into a cloud, and where that pulse of energy bounces off something, a raindrop, a snowflake, a hailstone, some of that's going to bounce back to the radar. The radar has been programmed to be smart enough to know what that is, to know where it is, to know how much of it's out there, and to know which direction it's moving. And then it presents that information in a color-coded screen, a picture like you see here on the right. Usually blues and, white, uh, blues and greens are light rain, yellow would be heavier rain, and reds and pinks are bad news. If you have on your home phone, on your iPhone, or maybe your, your mobile device, your iPad, or even on your desktop computer, if you have a weather app that has weather radar, like the outstanding Fox 2 weather app, the best weather app in town, I say, if you have the Fox 2 weather app, it will have a radar option that you can display. Having the, the ability to display that radar is not going to do you any good if you don't know what you're looking at. The part of the storm you want to be much watched most watchful for will be these white and pink areas inside the red. That's where hail is possible, or maybe even tornadoes could form nearby. The same mechanism that forms the hail can sometimes form tornadoes, so you want to be real careful about where you see that. All right? So that's how radar works. Radars are key to tracking thunderstorms. You just saw that thunderstorm in the radar picture. As I mentioned earlier, um, Tornadoes only come from thunderstorms, but most thunderstorms do not produce tornadoes. They are extremely rare when you look at the millions of thunderstorms a year and the thousands of tornadoes. They're very, they actually are very, very rare. But when they occur, they're very damaging and obviously very scary and can be very photogenic. They are wonders of nature, but after all, even though they're, they're destructive. This is a classic tornado uh, in this picture that uh, would affect Missouri. The, Nice smooth funnel that comes down out of the cloud, touches the ground, and you have the dust swirl that's being picked up underneath. By definition, a tornado is a violently rotating column of air that extends from the cloud all the way to the ground. And as I mentioned, tornadoes always come from thunderstorms. But it's a rare breed of a thunderstorm that produces a tornado. So it makes sense that if a tornado comes from a thunderstorm, it has to have the same ingredients, all right? Um, so you have the same ingredients as a thunderstorm, but there's an extra, a little extra uh, icing on the cake, an extra layer of icing on the cake that makes a tornado producing thunderstorm special. It gives it its ability to produce a tornado, and that's called wind shear. Wind shear is a change of wind direction and speed with height. The higher you go in the atmosphere, the faster the winds are going in from a different direction. How's that work? Let's take a look. So, this is my crude diagram of St. Louis. The winds down here at the ground on a spring or summer day might come from the south, the southerly wind, maybe 10 to 20 miles an hour, a breezy spring day. Well, you have to look upstairs. This is why we launch weather balloons, because up at 30,000 feet, when the jets fly, the winds might be blowing a whole lot faster. This is what's going to happen tomorrow, by the way, which is why I'm interested in tomorrow. We could have winds blowing at 80 to 100 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. Well, that difference in wind speed is 
this is kind of like water blowing or water flowing over uh, a waterfall or a water wheel. You're going to get a tumbling core of air, a tube of air here in the middle between the fast winds and the slow winds. It's actually going to start to tumble and rotate. I'm going to bring you out of sharing screen mode and come back on screen myself. So here's what happens. This should look like the circle. Remember that circle where the fast wind was on top and the slow wind was on bottom? Fast on top, slow on bottom. That starts to keep spinning. But again, it's not just a circle. It truly is a tube, what we call a rotor. So you have this whole tube in the atmosphere that's spinning like this. Now, on a clear day, no big deal. It might cause some, uh, some turbulence when a, a, a plane, if you're in an airplane flying through it, you get a big bump or two when you're flying through it, but that's it, it's no big deal. But you take this and move it under a thunderstorm, thunderstorm where all the air is blowing up, remember? Air rising creates the clouds. So now the air is rising into this tube, if, and now you're gonna tilt the tube on its side. So now this should look a little bit more familiar. All right, this looks like something else we've already seen video of or pictures of. Something you might be familiar with. All right. It will look something like that. That is your violently rotating column of air that extends from the cloud down to the ground, and it all comes together in a thunderstorm because of the wind shear. So that is a classic tornado. Tornadoes are dangerous. They're small, but they are dangerous, uh, and they need to be respected, all right? So to keep yourself safe when tornadoes come, you need to know some important, uh, some important terminology. As a meteorologist and as a group of meteorologists, we have a system in place that we use to, um, to help alert you on days when the weather could be bad. It's called the watch warning system. When we as meteorologists look at the atmosphere, when we look at the symptoms of the atmosphere, and we see signals that maybe today is not going to be a good day. Maybe we are going to have thunderstorms that might be stronger than normal. These are going to be the stronger variety storms. We might issue what's called a thunderstorm or tornado watch. That watch just means, you know what? You need to pay a little closer attention today. Make sure you do have the Fox 2 weather app handy on your phone. All right, or you are watching TV. Just be weather aware. It doesn't mean you need to cancel anything. You can still go out and play. You can still go to the neighbors. You can still play catch. You can go to your ball game. But I wouldn't do any of those things without easy communication. And I certainly wouldn't do it without keeping a very close eye on the sky. Because if the skies get dark, that's when you need to start thinking about checking back in and keeping a closer watch on the weather. Because bad weather could be coming. A warning. This is the, okay, no, you really do need to stop and stop everything and drop everything. This is the, you need to take action now moment. If your Fox 2 weather app alerts you to a severe thunderstorm or tornado warning, that means if it's a severe thunderstorm, damaging winds, winds that could down tree limbs or produce hail that's large enough to put dents in your car or in your room, uh, dangerous weather, you need to take shelter and move indoors. All right, that's a severe thunderstorm warning. If it's a tornado warning, that means, no kidding, you stop what you're doing now. You don't have time to finish your video game. You don't have time to go on a walk. You don't have time to take the dog out. You need to get everybody and take action to, take, to get safe. That means that there is a tornado coming your way. One has either been spotted on the radar. We've seen the rotation in the radar. Or somebody, literally, a storm spotter, has seen one come down and hit the ground. Either way... A tornado or severe thunderstorm warning is your time to drop everything and take shelter. So what does that mean? What do you mean take shelter? Where do I go? I don't know. I haven't really thought about where I should go. If you remember nothing else about today's presentation, if you remember nothing out of the weather classroom besides this, these three words, then I've successfully taught you something. Down the middle. Down the middle, down the middle, down the middle. Three words that could save your life, could save other people's lives. It's the most important thing you can do if there's a tornado warning. Get down in the middle. What do I mean by that? Down is pretty obvious. Down, get low, 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 low. Get to the lowest floor. Go down the stairs. Go to the lowest floor you can take stairs to. Get downstairs. Basement's fast. If you don't have a basement, then this thing to the ground you can get to. The lowest floor. Low, low, low. Down, down, down. And middle. You want to 
want to put as many walls between you and the outside of the tornado as possible. Why? Because each wall is something else that can keep you safe from stuff like you see in this picture. This is a tornado, the closest tornado encounter that I have ever had. It was in Perryville, Missouri on February 28, 2017. I was facing this bump and it's calling in reports outside about two miles away when it hit. All of this stuff that you see piled up is something that at one point was flying through the air at 200 miles per hour. If you get hit by one of those things, it's a bad day. All right? The whole purpose of down the middle is to keep yourself safe from that. And the best way to do that is to follow your tornado rule of thumb. The golden rule of tornado safety down the middle. If you go up, you're elevating yourself into the tornado. That's bad. You don't want to go up in the tornado. You want to stay down, down the middle. The golden rule. Video time. Nobody's falling asleep. I don't see too many other people. Let me see. I'm on page two and everybody's still awake. That's good. Alyssa, Keelan, Kyle, Jeremy. I see you, Jeremy. Yeah, I see you. I see Kira, Morgan, and I think I just woke Jeremy up. I'm just saying hi, Jeremy. It's all good. I see a teddy bear. All right, I'm just dropping into your room to make sure everybody's still awake. All right, tornado video time, okay? Don't be scared of tornadoes. And yes, tornadoes are scary. Don't be scared of them, though. Respect tornadoes, just like you respect your parents. When your parents are angry, what's the best way to make your parents not angry? Do what you're told. Go to your room, maybe hide. That's what I'm telling you to do in tornadoes. Don't be scared of tornadoes, hide from them. Go to the basement, go down the middle. And if you hide from the tornado and do what you're supposed to do, the chances of you having no problems at all are very high. Get by. This is your classic Missouri tornado here, all right? Uh, small, skinny thing, builds down to the ground. If it's on the ground for any period of time, it might be getting bigger. Most of the time when a tornado gets wider, it's getting strong. Okay, so this is a pretty strong tornado. This hit just outside of Kansas City a couple of years ago. In a couple seconds, we're gonna cut to a different picture, a little different angle, and now you're gonna see stuff flying around the tornado. See these little black specks? Actually, those are trees being yanked out of the ground and thrown up into the air. Uh, tornadoes can pull a huge tree out of the ground just like it's pulling grass out of, out of the ground. I mean, it does not take much for a tornado to do that. Tornadoes often get their color from the stuff they're picking up. In this case, this tornado is moving over an open farm field that hasn't been planted yet. So it's taking that rich soil, churning it up, and pulling it up higher and higher into the atmosphere. This picture also, this video happens to be coming from Canada. People don't think of Canada about tornadoes, but tornadoes can occur in Canada, and they do frequently in the sun. Tornadoes occur in all 50 states in the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska. They occur every month of the year, every season of the year, every hour of the day. So of our worst tornadoes here in St. Louis have been in the middle of winter and the middle of night. While the conditions are favorable and a watch is issued, we always need to be prepared. I show you this last tornado. This is a tornado in Oklahoma. I show this not to scare you, but to maybe put you at ease because we rarely get anything like this. They get them all the time in Oklahoma. We do not. Our tornadoes are more like the first one I showed you. This is the baddest of the bad, the biggest of the biggest. Do we get them like this? On a very rare occasion. Most of our tornadoes over here are smaller ones. It doesn't mean ours are any less dangerous because they are not. They're still good. If a tornado hits your house and day, you better hope you were going out there. Uh, but obviously, tornadoes are a little bigger in Oklahoma most of the time. Uh, so that uh, is a difference. And I want you to realize that it's not. Every time you see a tornado from Oklahoma, uh, that's not always the kind of stuff. Okay, so. That wraps it up for me. Again, don't forget the Fox 2 weather app, one of the best weather apps in all of weather. Download it at the Google Play Store or the Apple uh, iTunes, I guess. Um, it works great. You can program it for your location so that it knows exactly where you are. And if a tornado warning or watch, a thunderstorm warning or watch is issued for your location, it will automatically alert the phone based on your GPS location. So uh, they are super helpful, especially that wraps it up for my presentation. Uh, what I would like now would be for your questions. And you're the last group of the day, so I'm not worried about the clock if you're not. 
Okay, um, so we did have um, other, we had a lot of kids say, you know, this is really cool. They were really excited about the videos and some of the things you were showing. So they were really impressed on the chat. Um, Anna wants to know if um, it makes it easier for you to predict the weather when not as many people are out and about. I guess she means there's like less pollution and less humidity. Uh, not really. When, when, if you're talking like right now during the pandemic, one of the ways that I didn't talk about in terms of measuring, you know, we have weather balloons and we're still getting the weather balloons, but another source of that information that we can get, we get about, it's the same instruments, but on airplanes. When airplanes take off and land at airports, they have special sensors embedded in their nose cone that measure weather, uh, the same weather data. With fewer airplanes flying right now, we're getting fewer airplane reports that give us that extra bit of information. It's not a huge difference, but it does impact uh, some of our knowledge of the atmosphere right now. But in terms of fewer people being on the roads, it's not going to necessarily affect our ability to forecast. Actually, it might make it easier for me to chase tornadoes because I don't have to stop the track. That's true. Um... Okay, and then um, Trayden wants to know what your favorite type of weather is. <laughs> it, it's changed over the years, the older I get. It used to be my favorite type, without a doubt, was snow. I was a snow monster as a kid, spent hours and hours in the snow, frostbite, you know, and nothing faced me. I love being cold in the snow. Then I grew up. Uh, and I became an adult and I worked in television and it turns out in television they like to stick young meteorologists out on cold overpasses and tell people it's really cold out, don't stand out here. And all the while I'm the one who's really cold standing out there. And you do that enough times over 20 years and finally your body decides, oh, you know what, I don't like the cold very much. Uh, I love winter right up until the day after New Year's. Uh, I can take snow up to January 1st. I love a white Christmas as much as anybody. But once I get past January, I'm not very much used for it. I would be just as happy with spring the rest of the time. Um, so I, I love spring. It's my favorite. Actually, you know, every season has its, has its good side. I love spring. I love the, the flowers and the warm, the warm air. I love the first smell of cut grass. But I also like the first cold spell of fall when you have to wear a hoodie or a sweater. Um, so everything has its points. Yeah. Um, Caleb wants to know, when did you know you wanted to be a weatherman? Who is that, Caleb? Kaylee. Kaylee, okay. When did I know? Uh, about your age, actually. Um, when I was about your age in school, my grandfather took me up to our backyard. He was at our house visiting. He took us up to our backyard. We had a bit of a hill back there to watch a big storm come in, one of these big thunderstorms. And he made me stay up there the whole time while I was coming in, probably a little bit too long, but you know, grandpa's are that way. Um, and suddenly we had a lightning strike. And that lightning was close enough that the flash and the bang were like almost at the same time. And I went running indoors, but I, if you're part of the bad weather man here, it sparked my curiosity. I was like, man, that was actually kind of cool. Uh, and then I said, what, what caused the lightning? And then I said, okay, so a thunderstorm caused the lightning. Well, what caused the thunderstorm? Well, what caused, what caused the thunderstorm? That why question, that learning question, you know, that, that whole process the, the, of discovery and learning and exploring began. And that started when I was about your age and hasn't stopped even now. I mean, I, I'm not, I never finished learning about weather. Every day I learned something new about the atmosphere and I say, hmm, I didn't know, I, I didn't know that could happen. I've never seen that before. So you're all, it's always a constant learning process and it all started for me, for weather back when I was here. Cool, That's, I love that. Um, Camilla wants to know, why does weather in Missouri change so quickly? That's a good question, uh, because we're in the middle of everything. Everything that could influence your weather is a, day's, you know, a day away. Uh, you have the cold air from Canada, you have the warm air from the equator. You have dry air coming out of the uh, desert southwest, you have mountain air coming out of the Rocky Mountains, and all of it's within a day of St. Louis, and sometimes it all converges at roughly the same time. So we tend to be kind of the melting pot uh, of, the, of the United States in terms of weather. So you know, one day you might be on, 
in that warm wind from the south, but as that strong wind as you might flip into the cold wind on the other side, you get the cold air. So we're kind of right in the middle, that. depending on which one might be a little stronger, could tip the scale between being a, a warm, wet day and a cold, rainy or snowy day. And that all has to do with that balancing act we talked about at the very beginning. Okay, um, and then we had a lot of questions about the tornadoes, obviously, and one of the big ones was um, specifically like if they don't have a basement Wait, in their question? house, if they're out on the road tornadoes driving, the what some safety options for different scenarios? Okay, well, if you are, stand by, I have an answer to that. Oh, Wait. Let me reshare. Oh, I missed the. This. Let me start with what to do if you're driving. Okay, you should see an overpass. Yes. Okay. Um, remember our golden rule of tornado safety is down the middle. The first word is down, 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 down. There's famous video uh, of some a news crew actually that took shelter. Um, they got lucky. It was in 1992. And there was a tornado that was catching up with them on the Kansas Turnpike. And they ran out of time. There was no room. They had to stop and take shelter. Well, they, they broke the rule. They went up here. They went up, not down, and took shelter in the girders of the overpass. It just so happened the tornado bypassed them enough that they weren't injured. Um, but it is widely accepted that that is a bad idea. You never go up. You always go down. Now. That's a problem when you're in a car. How do you know where to go down? Well, there's a ditch here. There's a ditch that leads down the other side of this as well. There's a ditch over here. The interesting thing about wind, it reduces to zero the closer you get to the ground. So in that lowest six to 12 inches above ground, you have a wind that's going from really fast to nothing. There's no wind, the dirt's not moving, all right? The ground's not moving. So the weakest wind is actually closest to the ground. You go up 100 feet, and now all of a sudden you're in the strongest winds of the tornado. So going up is always a bad idea. You always want to go down. If you're in a car and you're driving, you have two options. And this is where an adult really needs to make this decision for you. You need to have an idea of what would be geographically aware of where you are. Are you in a position where you can drive a little bit further and get to a sturdy building and take shelter? Because if you are, and the tornado's behind you, and I mean, you need a lot of distance to do this, then go do that because a sturdy building is better than a ditch. If you don't have time, you do not want to try and outrun the tornado in the car because cars can and have been thrown around like toy trucks by strong tornadic winds. So tornadoes are not going to offer you, our cars are not going to offer you very much protection in a tornado. So your best bet is to get in that spot that's as low as possible and that's down in the ditch, lay as flat as you can in the ditch, and put your hands over your head. Um, it's not ideal, it's not as good as a basement, that's for sure, uh, but that's the best place to go if you're caught in a car out in the open, if you can't drive somewhere safe first. Um, if you are in a home without a basement, that's where down the middle comes from, really. Um, you don't have to necessarily have a basement. Obviously, it's ideal, I, a basement's best, uh, but if you are in a home without a basement, if it's a slab home, for instance, and many are, then you want to get down to the lowest floor, closest floor to the ground in that slab home. And again, in the middle, uh, put as many walls between you and the tornado as possible. Uh, I always recommend a coat closet. Uh, if it's a two-story home without a basement, then underneath uh, the stairwell uh, it can work as well. But a coat closet's great. And the reason why the coat closet's great is you have all the coats in there. Um, Take some stuff out real quick, make some room, get in there, sit on the floor, put your hands over your head, and cover yourself with the, with the jackets and the coats from the, from the closet. That'll offer you some extra protection. Um, I've heard bathrooms too. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes. Bathrooms um, are great as long as it's done not. The problem with bathrooms is they are often on the exterior wall, so you do sacrifice, uh, you do sacrifice some, some safety with that regard. Um, but the beauty of being in a bathtub is the bathtub, and I actually did a story, the kids are probably too young to remember the Joplin tornado, 
Yeah. But to the adults view, um, I did a story on a guy who survived the Joplin tornado in his apartment because he lay flat in the bathtub and then all the debris that fell that came down, um, all that debris collapsed over the top of the bathtub and it buried him, but he had, you know, he was in the tub, so he had, you know, six inches or whatever of clearance because it all lay across the top versus crushing. He couldn't believe he survived. Yeah, that was a... Um, and then what about, um, what about in a trailer home? Uh, that's a tough one uh, because that one is scary, and um, some of your students may live in, tra in, in trailer homes or modular ho uh, homes. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, they're proving that they're not as safe uh, in these other homes. In fact, that's where during a tornado watch or a thunderstorm watch, you all, if you live in a mobile home, you need to be a whole lot more weather aware than anybody else because you have. Uh, you have to get out. You literally have to leave the building you're in and take shelter somewhere else. And that means you need to have a pre-established nearby storm shelter or someplace that uh, has been determined to be safe that you can go to. And it takes time to get there. So you have to move earlier than most other folks. Some people who live in trailer parks and trailer homes and trailer communities um, know that, I mean, I get calls on this all the time at night, especially they call and say, hey, is there a chance I might need to move tonight? If so, I'm going to go stay the night with so-and-so so that I don't have to be in the middle of the night. So they have a plan ahead of time. Um, they, I hate to, to say that because they're very, some folks, it's, it's a quality home. You can have, uh, you can live in it. It doesn't say anything. It's just not as safe when it comes to quality. Mm -hmm. That's good to know that, to be extra aware, um, of storm warnings and of what might be coming. Yeah. But you just need to plan you need to plan further ahead. Sure. Um and then Henry and a few other kiddos want to know this your favorite part of your job. My favorite part of the job is that I get to come to work and talk about my favorite subject every day. Uh I love weather um because it's always somewhat different every day. It's a different challenge every day. Um, yes, sometimes Mother Nature just throws me for a loop and I get so angry, I just want to quit and leave, but then I come back and do it again. Um, it's, there's nothing more satisfying than, you know, my best days are when, obviously when I nail a forecast, I always want to be right, I take forecasting very personally. Um, I, I, I take no pleasure in, mess, in messing up a winter storm. You know, people get mad at us when the snow falls and rain, and they are they think we're overblowing it, or they think we intentionally get it wrong. I don't know why. And who would want to get it wrong and take a rap of the general public? That's that's insane. Um, but I do take it personally. I invest a lot of time and effort in in what I do um, because I want to get it right and. Especially when it matters, you know, tomorrow when we have some strong storms, it's going to matter maybe for some people. Um, and the payoff is when you do make a forecast and people say, because of something you said or during a tornado warning, I took shelter and my house is bombed, but I'm alive and I'm alive because of something you said. That's a powerful, uh, that's a powerful motivator uh, to keep doing what you're doing when people say it matters to yeah, I mean, well, obviously, you know, we get in our profession for the kids and the people, so we sure. understand that. It's, it is. It's all about people. It's about helping people. I love doing this. The fact that, uh, that I can take time out uh, and visit with all of you and see all of your faces and see that you're engaged. I mean, I've paged through all three pages. I've only seen one or two of you kind of doze off a little bit. Uh, <laughs> well, I've had a few fall asleep. I've had a few fall asleep in my Zoom meetings as a classroom, you know, teaching. So there's always so much we can do, but we just really appreciate you taking the time to do this. We didn't get to go on our field trip this year because it was oh, scheduled in April. So this is kind of our um, alternative, and we're just really grateful for your time and expertise. Well, it, it's my pleasure. And again, if you take nothing out of this, the down the middle for your tornado safety uh, is, is the best. What I would love to do right now before I let you go is do that screen grab. I can only get one screen um, because you're such a big group. But if I can grab that, then I will.
we'll show this on the air. Um, let's do that. I will show this on the air tomorrow morning at 8.30, and then again at 9.25, and I'll say hi to your class. Is that a deal? Yeah, that sounds awesome. Awesome. All right, so if everybody would look up at the screen at your camera, smile, and wave like you had a good time, all right? You can lie a little bit. Make it sound like you had a great time. Keep smiling. Keep waving. <coughs> All right. Cameron, you didn't ask any questions. Tell your mom I'm very disappointed. Very much. Okay, you did. I did ask a question. I did ask questions. You have a question. Yes. Go for it, Cam. Okay, wait. Let me go back to it. Oh, my mom had a question, too. No. Oh. Well, she had a question, but she wanted me to ask you. Um, how many tornadoes happen a year in St. Louis? Oh, in St. Louis, good question. It varies from year to year. Nationally, we get about 1,200 per year across the nation. Uh, in Missouri, we might get anywhere from 15 to 40 tornadoes a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, I'd say in a given year, we might have 6 to 10 in our local area. And by that, I mean my viewing area. Uh, we cover uh, 35 counties or about 85 miles in all directions of St. Louis. Uh, so if we get maybe 10 or 15 in a year, sometimes it's a lot less. Sometimes it might be a little bit more. Uh, but that I'd probably say that's the average uh, without a having the actual number directly in front of it. But that's a good question. Uh, it's more than a, just one or two, but it's less than two many. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Okay, I'm going to go. Hey guys, thank you very much. Um, bring you back over here so make sure we're here. Uh, thank you very much again for inviting me into your classroom. Good luck with the rest of your school year. I know it's tough, but if today's any indication, you're doing great. Keep hitting home runs. Teachers, thank you for all you do for your kids. I know it's a passion uh, for you as well, so keep it up. It's only three weeks to go, maybe two or three weeks. <laughs> yep. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. You take care. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.